Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the Feeder Series podcast. It's a podcast oddly similar to the excellent F1 Feeder Series podcast, but for reasons that may or may not be tied to copyright, this absolutely is not the F1 Feeder Series podcast. In any case, the Feeder Series podcast is your best guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and Happy New Year. We're ready to kick off another year, and to make sure 2023 runs as smoothly as a Swiss clock, we have not one, but two driving sensations from Switzerland. First up, let me introduce a driver who knows the feed of his world inside out from his years in F2 and below, but now he's busy spending his race weekends with a roof over his head and silverware in his hands. Welcome to the podcast, Louis Delatraz. Are you excited to dip back into the Feeder Series world for a little bit? Hi guys, yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm very excited to hear your insights, Louis. And joining Louis is a racer whose off-season is officially over after a three after three thrilling midfield duels in Dubai this weekend. That's the kind of sentence only Jake Sanson could get out properly. It's the 2022 Freca rookie vice champion and current PHM racing ace, Joshua Dufek. Have you recovered from the racing yet? Hello, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I, I literally just got back uh, yesterday, so just kind of getting used to everything again and uh, all of that, but yeah, yeah. Um, I've recovered, I think. Recovered for a podcast. Thank you so much for joining us straight away. So good to have you on, especially with some of the insight you'll have direct from Dubai, but also direct from Dubai, a voice you'll be familiar with after last weekend and one who you'll be joined by over a lot of weekends in January and February. And also the new Feeder Series karting editor, not a bad way to kick off the year. Jake Sanson, welcome back. Thank you so much. Great to be back on the podcast. And uh, yeah, I've started my year very early in 2023. Yeah, it's really good to have you on. And in Dubai at the moment still, and you'll be commentating all the races for the rest of the championship, right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, I'm the voice of uh, Formula Regional Middle East and F4 UAE right the way through till the season finale in Abu Dhabi in mid-February. So very excited. Well, we're going to dip into all of that. And if... uh, (laughs) This first weekend's anything to go by. You're going to be a very, very busy guy calling all of that. You did a great job, but we'll speak on it in a second. Before we get started, if you enjoy the podcast, please like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, or leave a rating or review. If you're listening, you can leave a rating on Spotify and review us on Apple Podcasts. With nearly 50 episodes under our belt in 2022, a 4.9 star rating, around 100,000 YouTube views, and 75,000 audio listens, We've decided to go do it all again for 2023. But this year, we want to be even better than before. So we want some of your feedback. So we've set up a short survey to shape the future of the podcast. Check out the YouTube description or the podcast show notes for the link. As I say every episode, the podcast is for you, viewers and listeners. So make sure that your voice is heard by checking it out. And if you haven't already, do check out Transfer Weekly, our second show on the YouTube channel, which keeps you up to date on all the driver announcements in the off season. Subscribing to the channel really helps us out. And if you are already subscribed, thank you so much. Okay, well, motorsport is back, everyone. Officially, let's start with you, Josh, as soon as you were racing in it this weekend. How do you feel? Well, it's a bit of a different sort of race for you. You always seem to be in the midfield action nonstop, as Jake was calling it. How was it from your perspective? You, you, You got the, was it P6 in race one and then midfield battles for the race? Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, just first of all, it was great to, to be back and, you know, to be able to be racing so early in the season is quite nice because, yeah, normally you wouldn't really get that opportunity so often. So, yeah, it was good to be there and, uh, you know, to, to race in that championship where you got so many different drivers coming from different places. Uh, it is really competitive and, uh, yeah, it's it's just a great way, way to prepare the season. So, um but as far as like how it went for me in this first weekend, I must say it, it didn't really go as well as I would have hoped it to go. Um, we had um, a few issues like uh, right from practice, mainly with the tires. Like, uh, yeah, well, obviously the first test days were, uh, you know, preparing the brakes and all of that and, you know, just getting into it and, 
um, yeah, I, I, I think I got up to pay quite well, uh, kind of Thursday. Um, I think that was a test day with only one test. Mm. And then, um, yeah, basically after that, um, yeah, we were, uh, it's, it's, it's a weekend of learning is what, well. by the way, I'm, I'm inferring what you're saying really, because new tires and everything. Basically it was kind of a, a weekend of learning a bit, but, um, yeah, our expectations were basically just really to be at the front, and um, yeah, we want to be right there, winning uh, and and getting podiums. And yeah, our goal is also to win the championship. So to end the the weekend, how we ended it was a bit disappointing. And I think from my side, you know, my performance could have maybe been better in some aspects, but I think I maximized a lot of the things that I could have maximized. And the thing that was very frustrating was that we believe we got a bad set of tyres for Q2 and then we used that set for race two as well. And mm -hmm. those were the two uh, sessions basically where, that kind of cost us the weekend because Q2 basically made my uh, gave me my position for race three. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, obviously after Q2, we, we weren't quite sure even what happened and how we were just like so off the pace. Um but we still use those tyres, unfortunately, then for race two, where I just dropped to the back. And then it was just clear that we had gotten a bad set of tyres because we saw, like, uh, yeah, I just had had no grip in that race. It's one of these things, uh, it's one of these things, Josh, that I hear from tyres talking about tyres so much that I have heard how difficult it can be. Jake, you were talking to the tyres as well, how the drivers were switching it up, right, with some of them using the tyres for race one, some using for race three. We had three winners, which is somewhat related to that with the first grid as well. And we had the resumption of Boganovic and Mini. We had amazing fight backs from last to silverware. Jake, how did you view the weekend? I think it's definitely improved overall as a show compared to 12 months ago. It was pretty decent uh, uh, last year when it was called Formula Regional Asia. And certainly now that Top Speed have done even more homework to get ready for the Middle East Championship, I quite like the way that the tyre choice allocation comes into play over the course of a weekend because it does give drivers a second chance, if you will. If race one doesn't go so well, they can sort of prepare for race two or prepare for race three uh, and come up with a good result. That's how Mari Boyer was able to win race three mm -hmm. because he was able to keep a spare set of tyres aside and basically drive away from the rest of the pack. But it also means that you have to be quite cautious in races because you don't want to wear tires out too soon, uh, say in race one, because you need to be flexible uh, in case you need to use that set of tires again for race two uh, in order to give yourself a fresh set for race three. So I do quite like the strategy. The play by play is quite an important part of what makes Formula Regional in the Middle East work. Uh, what's also really interesting at, at Dubai in particular, and Josh will back me up on this, is that just a one degree change in temperature, a one kilometer wind speed change uh, can actually really affect how the car handles. The crosswinds can really mess with the aerodynamics. And if you get a gust of wind in a particular bad place mid corner, then you can really lose traction. You can lose a lot of grip. Uh, so Dubai is a really good place to go racing uh, on the autodrome because you have so many varying factors. Even the data doesn't always save you. And you can go into the race fully prepared and then the changing conditions throughout the course of the race will catch you out. We saw that with quite a few drivers who went in quite prepared and then they just didn't have the pace they were expecting to have. It's a tough race circuit to go on. Well, we talk about how it changed quite a lot, but what changed at the end of race one, lap one, uh, lap one, lap, the last lap, should I say, with all the confusion, I know you were in the commentary booth and you had the same confusion as we did. What was it that had happened? So essentially there was a time system glitch, uh, which essentially counted down the time to zero and then automatically showed uh, that it was the last lap when actually we had run down to time and then had an additional lap. Now, when you're in the heat of the moment and you're following a race battle, you're not always looking at how many seconds there are left of the race to go. And you're looking for relevant information as you pick it out. So I'm there, you know, watching Boganovich 
and Mini very nearly swapping paint at the front, going <laughs> wheel to wheel. You look at your monitor and it says last lap. So you go, right, okay, well, it's the last lap. So this is it. This is why it's so intense. Uh, so when they cross the line 14,000 of a second apart, you're thinking, right, well, that's it, race, race over. That wasn't actually the case. There was another lap to go. Uh, now, there were some teams that were on top of that. Uh, there were other teams that weren't. So in Hitech's case, they clearly uh, showed to Mini, well, you just won the race. Now, another argument that makes that slightly difficult is that the light was fading very quickly indeed. Uh, and it wouldn't really be uh, a dim argument to ask them to end the race slightly early because, you know, it must have been Josh. Well, it must have been very difficult, Josh, to see at the very end of the race because there was not a lot of light to play with. Yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely getting quite dark and like I had some issues with oil being sprayed onto my car as well in front, which didn't help. But um, mm. no, it, it was getting dark, but it, it was still manageable. And yeah, I think um, I think, uh, yeah, that extra lap wouldn't have really changed, to be honest, with it being darker or, or anything like that. But right. no, it, it would have definitely been been better to, to end that race sooner than later, because getting pitch black and I think most of us drivers had still the tinted uh, visors on um, mm. yeah it would have become very difficult so I think uh, Gabriel Mini would have liked the lap to be uh, to race be finished one lap earlier as well to be honest Josh yeah. but to go quickly on this one because Louis you're so experienced you've been racing for such a long time and the big headline from the weekend really was that confusing game because the way that Mini it felt a bit better because of the penalties and stuff that came after but looked like he'd won the race but then there was an extra lap. And we've seen this all the way from the top with Formula One. We saw in Formula Two last year with Dennis Hauger. How easy can communication go wrong between the cockpit and the team? And do you have any standout memories from your time where something just went wrong that, that confused you? Yeah, it's it's very easy. And I think if your team is not on top of it, it's, yeah, I mean, it can be very confusing. Uh, I've had it once in karting. I thought it was finished. They showed me twice the one lap board. And I stopped racing and lost the win. Oh, wow. And I finished for four or something because I realized why the others still pushing. But that was my bad. Um, and then in Formula 2 in Monaco, uh, 20, 2020, I think, where the FIA just missed. After a red flag, uh, I wasn't a good strategy. And uh, I was eighth, running eighth, but the first that actually did my pit stop. So virtually leading. But they put all the cars that were had a pit stop a lap down. And we never recovered it. So I potentially lost a future race win in Monaco, which probably De Vries would have won anyway, because he was super quick that weekend. But it happens here and there, and I think we can just deal with it because it's more often you're just being told sorry, but you don't get your positions back. And uh, I think yeah, you have to try to be as much on top of it, and it happens, and there's nothing you, you can do, but it can be very frustrating. It sounds like a very pragmatic approach, uh, Louis. Yeah. Somebody who's <laughs> had to go through a lot of pain. Yeah, there is a few. It happens, and uh, I mean, I guess it's also not easy on on their side to keep everything up. And when there is a glitch, there is a glitch, I guess. Yeah, so a lot of these are quite unprecedented as well. I see with things like this. It's like, well, what's what's a precedent? What should we do when there's such a massive cock up? So it's a bit difficult. Um, Josh, Kuwait next up. We got so this weekend off, and then you're right back racing. Yeah. What have you learned from round one? I know I cut you off a little bit earlier because I knew this question was coming. So yeah. what have you learned from round one and for the rest of the championship? Well, I would say the essential things is that qualifying is very important. And I mean, that's just for all the former regional stuff. It's like in Freca, it's the same as well. And um, I mean, it is hard to overtake. So uh, the best job, the best you can do in qualifying easier it's going to be in the race then as well and um yeah then with the tires as well uh, i kind of want to come back to that a bit because basic basically it's just like it, it's something that's hard to control and um with what jake said earlier with the uh, the way the tires are given i think it's actually given very well and uh, i think it does make for, for very interesting strategies and you kind of have to uh, think about how you're going to maximize your points throughout each race like um, yeah I remember going to race one and we were not sure whether to go on new tires or used tires and there's all this discussion on what the other what we think the other drivers are going to do as well and it makes it a lot more interesting but um, yeah just these few like sets of tires that have come in uh, that 
I know are ba bad quality or something. And I'm, I know that I'm not the only driver who has received them. I know I, I'm pretty sure high tech, like a lot of the high tech drivers have gotten them because, you know, when you see some of those drivers from that caliber, like for example, Jack, Jack Crawford, um, yeah, you would definitely expect him to be running at the front, but uh, for some reason, him being completely off the pace, it just doesn't make sense. And um, it's kind of a thing that's frustrating and it's out of our control, but um, yeah, we just have to kind of do the, the best job against it. And in the end, it's the same for everyone. It's just, I guess, some people will be a bit more unlucky and, than others, but yeah, it should even out throughout the championship. So, so it's but fine. I was about to say, it's like when you go to the karting yeah. track for like for just a casual karting, right? And you turn up and somebody gets a duff cart, but you go over the next weekend, it's you get the best cart. So, fingers crossed that the tyres even out over the five five rounds. Yeah, I I know like uh, our pace can be very good, and I I have a lot of confidence in uh, the PHM package and. Um, and what they they have provided me as uh, with you know the material and the car and everything so i know we can be extremely fast and uh if everything goes our way and if we just if we maximize everything then um yeah i'm confident we can uh, get a great result in all the next rounds jake briefly touching on the massive grid for formula 4 because uh, there was more than just the fremec with the frenetic racing. See what I did there? I'm after your job. Um, <laughs> you really are, aren't you? Well, I thought you were smarting then a moment ago from the last time you went karting when you mentioned, oh, when you got a duff cart. <laughs> Every single time. I think it was, uh, I think it's just poor, poor talent that's the biggest problem. But You've seriously, definitely been to the Jake's Dancing School of Racing, haven't you? <laughs> Formula 4, though. Loads of drivers. Not as many winners as there was in, in Formula Regional Middle Eastern Championship. But what are the headlines from you from the Formula 4 this weekend? Well, from F4, I think uh, what's really interesting is that we've got three outstanding talents at the front end of the field without any shadow of doubt. Uh, Yugo Ugochukwu, who I think everybody kind of expected to be towards the front. He has a year of F4 behind him now, so he knows the car very well. And he's in arguably the best team. Prima. I think everybody talks about them as being the pinnacle of F4. Uh, Tuka Tarpanen, who I've been speaking about now for four years in karting, and I think pretty much anybody who knows karting knows that Tuka is one of the most immaculate talents to come out of the sport probably in the last 20 years, and certainly the best Finn to come out of uh, junior academy racing probably since Kimi Raikkonen, which is massive praise, but I think it's probably very justified. A big shout. Uh, I mean, it, it absolutely is. I mean, as the new karting editor, you'll hear a lot about Tucker this year. And, you know, I've got a lot of things to say about him and many of his contemporaries. Uh, and the other driver is Arvid Lindblad, who is very much riding a lot of pressure this year uh, as a second year Red Bull junior driver. I think your second year is always very, very tough if you're in the Red Bull Academy. So you kind of have to pull results out of the bag. And the win this weekend is such a catalyst for Arvid Limblad. It's a massive, massive deal for him. And I think it really will give him a lot of confidence. It'll give him a lot of resurgence. And I think all of the fear that he might have had last year of, am I good enough to stay in the Red Bull package? Am I good enough to be here? Do I need to really prove what I can do? I think a lot of that will fade over the next couple of weeks and he'll just come into his own and he'll really start to settle down. So for me, there's three very clear championship uh, title protagonists, which is nice after the first weekend. There's yeah. only 14 of the 39 drivers that actually scored points. So there's a lot of drivers with homework to do, which is going to be quite interesting heading to Kuwait, uh, which is a circuit that nobody's ever really raced a single seater on at international level before. So that's going to be quite interesting uh, to see how that plays out. But yeah, the, the waft of talent in F4 UAE is extraordinary. I mean, looking at the drivers that are actually in F4 UAE this season, there are 39 of them, and I would say that probably about 36 of them are world class, which is quite incredible. You know, they're, they're, the, le the level of ability there is just absolutely extraordinary. And it's probably the most competitive single seater grid I think I've ever seen, which is quite an amazing thing to say. But in terms of the level and the equality of the talent out there, it is absolutely phenomenal. And we're going to see 12 really, really good races from here on in, I think.
I really hope so. I have to say as well, not just on the F4, and I'm not going to just say this to blow smoke up a, a certain Swiss man's bottom here, but it goes for pretty much everything that's in, in the Middle East right now. Because I just thought if there was COVID again and everyone got locked down, there's such a plethora of talent, talented driver. When I was going through the, the Middle Eastern Championship grid, and you know, we've talked about Kimi Antonelli, Antonelli last year, like he's a second coming of God or something, with how much praise this kid's had but then you go through the rest of that championship and it is almost like it was a few years ago with like the who's who of well we've got these we've got a formula two driver in there you got formula three you got frecker you got all these top talents and it's like when we've gone through the last year championing these people and then putting them all together it's like such a good championship i've really been infused by it it's well Josh, you know, it's it's the tyres which might be more more problematic or things that are outside of the drive. Yeah. But this is where I want, this is where I really want pure single seater spec series. I want these cars to be identical because I would love to see how this all shook out. No, I mean, um, it, it, in whole, I think it's, it's an amazing championship. And yeah, with all the drivers that come in and everything, um, it's just, you've got such a big mix of drivers come from different places, different championships. And um, yeah, it's just a great place to learn as well because um, you know, the tracks are different. Mm. The tires are different. The cars are slightly different. It's there, there, there'll always be something a bit new for every driver. And um, yeah, it's, it's great to kind of um, improve your adapting skills as well. And um, yeah, no, it's, it's great. I would say in the whole, it's it's a great it's a great championship, and that's why we're doing it as well, and especially to prepare for uh, your proper season. It's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's really good. With twenty twenty two fading away, almost faded away, I want to take a moment to hear from you, Louis, on how you enjoyed. Um, I don't know how to really describe it. A season of variety and massive success. How how was twenty twenty two for you, Louis? Yeah, hey, it was, I mean, 2022 was amazing. Um, you know, I moved to sports cars after four years in F2 and I reached a point where, I, yeah, it was very successful in single seater and suddenly, yeah, you basically, yeah, Formula 1, you need money. You need politics, you need also the, the right timing. Uh, and I didn't win Formula 2, which is fair. There was all the drivers with me, very good drivers that are all in F1 now. So I have no regrets, but there was nowhere anywhere to go any, in single seater for me. And I always loved endurance from my dad. And now to see the success that, that we had this year and uh, also obviously 2023, I'm very excited. We have Daytona coming now and I signed with Acura. So, you know, all those things to become a factory driver and become a professional because in the end, yes, in F3 and F2, you work as a professional, but you don't yet um, are. I mean, you, you definitely commit to your life is, is racing. Your life is single seater. Um, but it's either you make it to F1 or you have to find to find something else. And you see, it's very hard. And to achieve this and win all those races last year, win the LMS again, uh, went to America, enjoyed America so much. Just amazing championship, to be honest. Uh, rediscovered racing and I had so much fun. Uh, and yeah, then, I mean, we have Daytona coming end of this uh, week. So it's uh, pretty, pretty awesome. And it was one of my best seasons in motorsport, I can definitely say 2022. Wow, what a, what a statement. You can see just uh, if people aren't, aren't watching, if they're listening. One, you're missing out on some amazing Swiss scenery behind Mr. Delatraz. Uh, but two, beaming face. You can probably hear it is the way he speaks about it as well. Just You can tell how happy you are with this decision. So delighted for it. Now, you're talking about 2023 and it's the IMSA Enduros and stuff you're doing with one of, I have to say the Kuro, one of the sexiest cars that I've seen how <laughs> it, it is gorgeous how, how it is it is going for it how are you enjoying it are you looking to do anything around work are you need to do ELMS is it just purely staying stateside what's what's the plan yeah so I, I have a deal in ELMS um this is uh this is uh I have a deal I cannot tell you where yet but I have a, a deal uh, alongside my IMSA commitment the IMSA will be the, the main thing because obviously Akura has a long-term project um, those LMDH rule hypercars are incredibly nice. The technology on board, I would compare it to Formula One, of course, it's slower um, and it's not a single seater, but we have hybrid now, we have a lot of power. 
and uh, those cars are are beautiful. And I mean, I don't know about the others, but I see the Porsche, the BMW, the Cadillac, they all look cool, the Ferrari as well. Um, but I, I'm pretty confident in our car. And uh, I mean, I can't wait to put it on track against everyone. For sure, there will be a bit of BOP play, but I can't wait to see what we, we can do because being in a top league and being with a manufacturer has always been a dream. And I mean, I get to, to achieve it next week, so I, I can't wait. I'm so looking forward to to seeing how you get on. I looked on just uh, some research before the before the pod. Looked on your Twitter and just seeing the short video of it going around the track. I was like, imagine watching that and thinking, I'm going to sit in that car. What a what a world! And uh, Josh, just briefly on you, and this is good on the endurance side, which of course you're a, you're a young driver in single seat. It's Formula One's a dream and blah blah blah. But this is 2023, and LMDH looks shit hot. Let's be honest. Are you view this potentially as now? There's also like there's a different world that's possible for you. That there's Formula One, there's Formula E, there's now WEC looks really amazing as well. Would it be something that you'd be open to should the opportunity come? If the opportunity would come, potentially, yeah, I would be interested, of course. But I feel, you know, I feel like until I haven't tried every single thing possible and until I'm like 100% sure that. You know, I really can't make it to Formula One. I, you know, I, I won't really try any other routes or, I mean, un- unless I get a very good deal or something <laughs> or you never know what can happen. But um, no, the goal is really Formula One. And um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a long journey. And I feel like we've put in so much work already and we're going to keep on putting in work. And um, yeah, I, I'm... F- 100% committed to to making that dream come true and uh, yeah that is definitely the end goal I completely understand uh, it was a bit of a, a bit of a long shot for me to think you'd say anything other than that but I am I'm yeah. fascinated to hear from people this year with WEC just looking so good I'm not massive into looking at in the endurance racing but even I'm getting really hooked into how this is the it. year this isn't is it? the year to get into it mate isn't it just it is it just <laughs> It looks just so good. Well, that's enough questions for me because the Feeder Series podcast is for you, viewers and listeners. We're going to move on to the hashtag AskFS part of the podcast. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskFS on Twitter, joining our Discord and use the podcast questions channel. You can comment on our YouTube videos or keep an eye out on our Instagram posts and stories. First episode of the year, and as ever, loads and loads of questions. So apologies if we don't read yours out. We're trying to get through as many as possible. Let's go for this one first from Kimmy Martinez on Twitter. This is a question for Louis. Knowing that you're going to do selected IMSA races with prototype cars this year, what are the major differences you found between the LMP2 car you drove in WEC, LMS, and IMSA and the prototype car that you're driving this year? So... I've got to be careful with what I say here because obviously those Secrets. prototypes are are very uh, new. There's a lot of technology and uh, I really don't want our competitors to <laughs> no secrets we have. But uh, what I can tell you is LMP2, first of all, is an amazing car, um, but it's very basic in a way, which is a, a naturally aspirated engine. And uh, everyone has the same chassis, same engine, same everything, just to set up very similar to a 4, 3, F2, just with prototypes. Uh, the new LMDH I hybrids. Um, our engine is uh, yeah, so engines are very small, rev high. Uh, we have electric power. It's all on the rear. We don't have four four like hypercars, but also compared to LMP two, it's it's much heavier. Uh, so you do feel the weight. Uh, we also have a good amount of downforce, but I would say that the, the weight always carries you. Um, it's a different approach. It's always harder to save it. If you get a big snap of oversteer compared to LMP2, LMP2, you will be very active and easy to catch up. And then uh, a hypercar or LMDH, if it snaps at high speed, you, uh, yeah, bigger moments. Let's put it this way. Um, and then all the technology inside onboard the steering wheel. In LMP2, it's very basic. Not much you can do. In the LMDH, we can adjust everything. The differential, the braking migration, the brake balance. The steering wheel, we got a booklet with a 25 or 28 pages to learn for Daytona with about 300 possibilities of what we can change, how we can regenerate, what we can use. And it's incredible. 
it's like uh, I've never seen such advanced cars. It's very similar to when I tested in F1, actually. Wow, that sounds amazing. Just on the, the weight side of things, how and this might be a secret. I don't know. It's like top secret stuff you've got. But you talk about the weight side of things. Is that something you can shift around? If, can you put the weight to where you want? Because you're saying you get oversteer. Is it all at the rear or is the, the weight kind of evenly distributed across the car? No, so I don't want to say a wrong number, but I think the LMP2 is 930 kilos. Nine, yeah, 930. And the LMDH is 1030, so 100 kilos more. Yeah. Obviously, each manufacturer can build its car. Okay, the chassis are Dallara or Reca or I mean the, the manufacturer and then can put the weights where they want. But once the car is homologated, you can't really shift it anymore. Mm. You can only shift the ballast, which is same as single seater and, and make it how you think is, is the best. But you, you don't have so much play into it. I just think a heavy car in general, when it moves and snaps as every aero car, and uh, it, it basically gets harder and harder to catch. A light car is more reactive. Mm. Uh, a heavy car, obviously, you have more bringing you. It's like if you drive a truck, okay, it's very um, exaggerated, but the way it brings you, it's very hard to stop. <laughs> so I think, I'm not saying my Acura is a truck, I don't <laughs> know, it's a very good one. There. <laughs> you see the headlines now. But, uh, yeah, yeah, but um, that, that's what I meant more. The weight carries you, and in a way, you have to adjust. When you come from single-seater, which is very light to this, it's a big of a shock. I completely understand. It sounds so different. It sounds just like you've got a new, like you say, Formula One, you've got something new to play with this year. So tremendous stuff. Anyway, I need to rush on through. This one's from Stein via Discord. To Josh. What's it like driving in Dubai, and what is the city like in general? Now, we'll confirm you're not in the city now, because you've also got snow outside of your window. But how, yeah. was, how was Dubai? How was the track? How did you enjoy it? It's a completely new experience to anything, uh, you know, I've ever done in Europe. Like, uh, just, you know, arriving at the airport, driving through the city, sand everywhere. <laughs> Actually, when, when we arrived there, you know, normally they only get like one or two rain days in the year. And we ended up arriving on exactly that day and it was flooding and everything. And yeah, but no, it's it's super cool to drive because it's a whole different atmosphere. And the fact it's so different to Europe makes it a lot more, you know, intriguing and interesting as well. So, uh, yeah, as a whole, I would just say it's it's very exciting. And, and like when you're driving, you see all the tall buildings in the background, uh, you know, in the sunset as well. Oh, it's, it's super nice, honestly. Did you get a chance to be a tourist at all? Did you go do all the touristy things or not so much? I, I went into a mall. That's about <laughs> as touristy as, as I got. So yeah, but which really mall? Like... There's like 20 out here. What do you want about? There's like 20 <laughs> the, to choose from. The, I didn't go to the big one, the... Ah, okay. more, more of the Emirates. I think it's more of the Emirates. I, I didn't go yeah. to that one. I went to uh, the Ibn Battuta Mall. It was the oh, one wow. right next to my hotel. So <laughs> you, yeah. you really went far, didn't you? Wow. You could have gone in there, visited the, yeah. the tremendous sights of Jake Sanson and his uh, leopard skin bed sheets because <laughs> it's, it's one of the top things to do in Dubai, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> the video diary may appear, Jim. It may well appear. <laughs> Seeing those sheets now, I'm glad I did. <laughs> yeah, very true. Very true. It's a bit dodge. Yeah, I have got a couple of questions. Um, uh, fortunately, we've got some more questions. Uh, F1 Aholic uh, has come forward. A question for Louis: uh, Do you find it easy to have a race week off, or do you always find yourself wishing it was race week? I know I certainly do. Um, last year. I was happy to have a race week off. I mean, I did three championships, Ilmes, WEC, IMSA, a lot of travel with America. So I had a very busy year. And uh, also, I mean, we had 19 races and the shortest race was four hours. The longest was 24. So it's a bit longer than the, the usual sprint races. I was tired. Um, so it was great to have a week off at some point. But I mean, in the end, after three, four days, you miss it because it's my passion. It's what I love and uh, it's what I want to do. So um, in certain times, I would say I take the, the week off. Um, but often you want to get back in the car uh, really quick. Like now the off season has been only four weeks for me, but I I'm, can't wait to be in Daytona. What day is the Daytona? Because that's, that's coming up in two weeks. I'm flying to US Wednesday, to Orlando, not to Miami, actually. And uh, we have the Roar, which is like a test weekend before a pro prologue event. 
And then the race is uh, last weekend of January, 28th, 29th, I think. Oh, best best days is uh, someone's birthday here. So really, really good dates for oh, racing. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will think about that. <laughs> Don't you be selfish with your time now. Uh, so we have uh, AS19 has asked uh, a question to Josh via Discord. Uh, he wants to know, Josh, what was the turning point for you in Freca last year? Was it something that you changed or was it an overall improvement from the team? Well, um, I think the first few rounds were kind of like a wake up call for me. And, uh, you know, they weren't bad and we knew the speed and the potential was there. But we just realized, like, uh, I remember we, we had a meeting with um, yeah, my manager, my dad, my trainer, all of basically my whole team around me and, and really like thought about what we could do to, to you know, up the performance and, um yeah get the results we wanted and I think it's especially during that su summer where I really put in so much work with uh with yeah my whole team as well also my engineer and just doing a lot of overtime and I think that's kind of what gave me that advantage compared to all the other drivers on the grid and um yeah I mean I'm, I'm glad I did it now as well because uh yeah the progression and and kind of the the learning curve and, and all of that was was huge and um yeah it, it was just a, a great end to the season although it could have ended better with the championship don't think it of still, it that way you happy. had a you had the championship of two yeah. halves mate and you got to look at that second one you were terrific during that. that's where the yeah, podiums yeah. and the points came and you just learned from that for exactly this year. come on let's be positive yeah positive. yeah um, Another question for you, Josh, while we've got you. What's your favourite track during your Freca stint? And I'm not going to put this because I've obviously, well, maybe it is the same answer, but obviously Red Bull Ring was uh, a nice track. But yeah. for you, but what's, what, what about one that you enjoyed driving? I've been asked this question quite a lot. And to be honest, it's really hard to say because, um, you know, with Freca, you've got so much variety mm -hmm. and all the tracks are honestly, really nice to drive and I enjoy them so much but I think some of the tracks that I've really enjoyed obviously Red Bull Ring but also I really liked Hungary Ring because I'd mm. never been there before and actually I, I really liked the flow of the circuit and um, yeah also how technical it was um, I'm trying to think obviously Mugello everyone loves Mugello I feel like and it's it's just an incredible track to drive so um, I'm yeah, noting but, something about the uh, the latter half of the season again here, you know, just uh, coincidentally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, Imola. Imola was at the start of the season. And I absolutely love Imola as well. Um, I don't really have anything bad to say about any of the tracks. Yeah. They're, they're all great tracks. And um, yeah, Freca, they, they've done a, a great job to, you know, pick out those, those tracks. It's a shame we're not going to Monaco this year, but... Mm. Uh, um yeah uh i think hockenheim ring is replacing that one so yeah we'll see more classics uh louis this yeah. um this question both of these questions by the way were from yna yna bananas on twitter and um, the last one and this one for you louis you've driven in WEC elms f2 and imza personally which was the most physically demanding for you uh physically demanding in terms of intensity, it's for sure Formula 2 because you don't have um, power steering. So, like, we got in endurance, obviously, we stay up to three and a half, four hours in cars. So, without power steering, we probably would not make it, um, <laughs> which makes it a, a lot easier, obviously, uh, in terms of, of arm weight and how, yeah, how hard it is. Formula 2, I can remember my last year when we went to the big, to the 18 inch wheels mm. in Port Ricard in Monaco, oof, was tough. You really had to train. And I mean, I, I liked it because some drivers at the end of the race were getting tired and somehow I'm, I'm small, but I was not. And uh, and I, I enjoyed that. But um, definitely a harder. Then in terms of probably tiredness, men mental side, endurance is harder because yeah, it's longer and traffic and uh, night driving, stuff like this. But physically speaking, I have to definitely. Simple, uh, simple answer. Jake, you've got the next couple of questions again, please. I have indeed, yes. Uh, so I have a question from Timotheo STS Wygarov via Instagram. Great I pronunciation. That. 
I probably butchered that big time. <laughs> Even Taz and the Zach's name is easier to say. <laughs> uh, Josh, Josh, this is a question for you. Uh, over the past couple of years, one aspect of your driving that really stood out to him was your overtakes. Uh, have you had to change your approach to overtaking from a technical and psychological viewpoint going from F4 to Formula Regional? That's quite an involved question, that. Yeah. Uh, no, very good question. I mean, I, I, I think overtaking like the principle is kind of the same wherever you drive you, you just have to be committed and um yeah you have to go into that race wanting to really destroy everyone uh because <laughs> if you're like a bit that's how i go into every race because if you go into to a race and you think like you know you start doubting you won't really be able to you know you'll you'll have doubts when making those moves and they might lead to crashes and um yeah you just need that determination basically and the overtaking and and the moves they kind of come with you know experience and, and all of that so yeah in the end from f4 to to freca now I, I don't think it's changed too much freca is definitely a, more difficult to overtake because the car's being bigger and i think the slipstream well just the slipstream effect as well isn't as as big um so yeah but in the end the principle is the same i had to say your bounce back move on zagazeta in i think it was race two it might have been race two or race three that was a pretty yeah. decent move on turn one i, I liked that one a lot that was uh pretty banzai Thanks, yeah. and you managed to make it stick <laughs> without even a blemish of run wide it was very nice i, I thought yeah that's josh yeah. getting it done it was nice <laughs> So yeah. uh, Srihari underscore Desai uh, has uh, got a question for Louis. Uh, we saw a contrasting difference between yours and Pedro Piquet's season in 2020. And then similarly in 2022 for Felipe and Clem. Is F2 really that tough as a rookie? It's probably a good question for you. F2 is really tough as a rookie, especially if you're not entering in, um, in a top team. Let's put it mm -hmm. this way. There's a few teams which have uh, a lot of experience and can teach a, a young driver. I had my first care, basically, my first care in the real F2, not the GP2, the new car, uh, was with Charouz, which was a new team. And I mean, Charouz, as a lot of people speak badly about them, I have to say I had a really good time there. People are really nice and talented. And uh, the engineers I had at that time were, were great, but we didn't know anything. And F2 is all about knowledge. You get one set of tire in practice and you go straight to quality and straight to race. You don't have time to adapt. So we were learning and we were learning too slow compared to experienced teams. And then when I joined Carlin and I got in the work workshop and they taught me this everything about the tire, about set setup, about the approach and, and driving, I became a different driver. And I think that's how the year after I could bring my experience to Charouz and we had this such a strong season. Like a spy. Um, <laughs> a little bit <laughs> part of the game <laughs> and uh yeah so when pedro i think i can only come speak for myself and, and pedro because obviously with the mp I'm, i wasn't there I, I don't know but um yeah as a rookie it was probably harder for him and then obviously the, the confidence i had he didn't have and i guess you, you carry it along but pedro is a really good driver so you know i'm, I'm sure if he carried on he, he would have been fine but the decision of which team you're going to at the right time at the right moment is very important in f2 very. I've always found the play-by-play -play between drivers going from one team to another in F2 and sort of the information they take with them fascinating because obviously yeah. everybody has the same car. So, it, yeah, I've always found that a really intriguing side. And F1, it. everything changes year to year as well. But F2 exactly. is, it is so interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. And you know what's interesting about the MP is that I, uh, in 2021, I almost went there before oh, switching wow. to sports cars. And okay. um, I thought... I had this, I was announced, I said, I stopped Formula 2 after Abu Dhabi. And, uh, well, they called me up and they said, do you want to test for us? And we dominated the test in Abu Dhabi. And I had a second thought, mm, should I go a fifth year in Formula 2? And I was, um, to be honest, it's not worth it. I, I will not go. It doesn't look like I will go to Formula 1. I have a super license, but I think it's time for me to, to leave. And with these discussions over winter, and then I, I signed with WRT in, in Endurance, so didn't go to F2. But when I tested that car, the first thing I said is, wow, I've never felt so much grip in high speed. Oh, never wow. felt in any F2. And I drove a lot. And, um, well, 
that I think 21 they they no they didn't want they won 22 yeah they improved yeah. pretty well anyways they were such straight away strong and I think they found something I genuinely mm-hmm. believe that they they found a way to set the car up which I don't know what because they wouldn't tell me because obviously I was only testing. <laughs> You're gonna go but, back to Sharu uh, and take it with you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I swear it's the only F2 car I drove that that has this something and that maybe some other teams found out by now. Hmm. In Bahrain, in the high speed stuff, I've been flat in turn twelve, all single test, high fuel, low fuel, new tire, used tires, which I could not do in other cars. And I don't know why. I will never know why. But it was so interesting to see them become so strong suddenly. Yeah, wow, interesting. Get, I've got Hauger on and climbed up. You got one more question. We do indeed. Yeah, <laughs> I've I've got one final question, and it's to both of you actually. It comes from Hoopov via Discord. Uh, who is the best driver that you've raced against? I'm going to pitch that to Josh first. I imagine that's quite a tough one to answer at the moment. That is a very hard question to answer. Um, you know, I think to be able to really. Uh, say what the best driver uh, who the best driver is who I race against has to be my teammate because um, one of my teammates because that's where you really get the most comparison and where you can kind of see the most and um, I think it Oli Oli Berman in 2021 was was a very strong teammate and was probably the yeah the most competition I've I've had and uh, yeah, I also was able to learn a lot from him. So I would say probably that. Solid answer. Hmm. Louis? Um, well, I only tested with him in the same team was with Max Verstappen. So obviously quite, quite well known. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was impressive. He really was very impressive. And in the wet in Spa, we'll always remember he arrived out as a rookie in testing. was Yeah. That day I thought, okay, this one, there's no no luck, you know, he's good. <laughs> um, but yeah, on real racing side, I would say in endurance, I've raced a couple of times with Robin Freins, who I think talent-wise is really impressive. Probably not the hardest worker, but uh, I mean, he doesn't need to work apparently because he's just <laughs> flying everywhere he goes. Um, and on a different side, I think Robert Kubica, who has been my teammate for the last two years and uh, what he's achieving and the person he is and technically speaking, the knowledge uh, for me, probably the yeah, biggest talent I've seen uh, ever. I've never heard a driver speak about Kubica in any negative way. The people are so yeah, massively impressed by him. I know we're short of time, so we're going to go really quickly with one word answers to these very important questions at the end. This is racing for a girl and it says to Josh but I'm going to go for both of you so Josh first what's your favourite meal? Oh my favourite meal I would have to say chicken uh, and Ch- I Just chicken so much... not, not favourite animal <laughs> whatever chicken meal. well <laughs> any <laughs> any chicken really I like <laughs> chicken so much because <laughs> right, so you got, got KFC for Josh <laughs> Louis favourite yeah. meal I, I'm really weird with food. People that know me will uh, will be laughing right now, but um, I cannot eat any sauce. I just eat anything plain. So I will also go with chicken, but with pasta for me. <laughs> just plain chicken yeah, and pasta. Chicken and pasta. Okay, plain okay. chicken, plain pasta, and a bit of olive oil, and, and I'm very happy. <laughs> I could cook for you, no problem. Just chicken, easy. Um, yeah. That question, uh, uh, that was question three for girls. This really... question's from Lotto Russell, who wants to know again, what's your favorite cheat meal? Uh, Josh, first. Cheat meal. Uh, kebab. Oh, wow, <laughs> good kebab. answer. Um, yeah, yeah. Probably. I love that. I love that, Louis. Cheat yeah. meal. Um, definitely after a twenty-four hour race, I'm stopping at McDonald's. I have to. It's uh, needed. What's and your feels, order though? At that moment, feels healthy. You know, if it's not <laughs> even, but it feels like <laughs> feels like I'm getting life again. Okay. Well, if I'm at the drive-through and you're going to McDonald's, what's the order you're getting? Is it Big Mac and a milkshake? What are you getting? Uh, I'm getting very easy. I take the chicken nuggets and uh, and fries. It's it's uh, to go. Course, and not yeah. even a burger. No, with no and sauce, of course. That makes that makes sense. Yeah. Makes yeah, sense. yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. <laughs> and last question, because uh, yeah, we have to go. We've gone a bit long. Ash Slay by Discord. <clears throat> To both Louis, so Louis, you're going to have to go first this time, and Josh, what is your favourite type of cheese? Oof, uh, I, I know I'm Swiss. I know I'm going to disappoint my country, but <laughs> I, I don't like cheese. I'm sorry. 
Oh, whoa! The internet just whoa. exploded. Oh yeah, my yeah. god! So uh, that's like it is. I cannot do anything about it. But I, I totally respect it. It's like, and I mean, you. I can bring you Swiss cheese if you want. Um, uh, front I, I page headline: <laughs> Swiss I, person doesn't like cheese. Save the best to last. <laughs> but Josh, can you please rescue all the pride for Switzerland? <laughs> I'm I'm gonna disappoint Switzerland as well. not as much as Louis, but. Um, I'm not a big fan of Swiss cheeses, to be honest. <laughs> like, I, I like them, but my favorite would be cheddar and mozzarella, I, I would say. That's a fair answer. I just can see the sponsorship money just disappearing from both of you, right? Yeah, but it's a Swiss I company. Chocolate, yeah. I love chocolate, just in case. <laughs> just chocolate, Swiss chocolate. Good answer. Very good. That's PR speaking, Louis. All right. Well, on that bombshell, as Jeremy Clarkson would say, I can't believe that. I don't like cheese. It's, uh, you know what? It's interesting. That's the second time we had. Um, we had a French driver that you might have heard of called Théo Pochet, who also doesn't like cheese. It's just what is going on with drivers and cheese. But oh, that's all the time we have this week. We have to stop there because I need to go and have a lie down after this revelation. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. Make sure you check out the survey in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. We really want to make the podcast the best it can be. If you'd like to have your question asked in a future episode, use the hashtag AskFS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube. You can respond to our Instagram stories or post or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. If you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing all really helps us out. And if you're listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. Finally, check out feederseries.net for more feeder series insight and follow feeder underscore series, FS Americas and feeder series now on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everyone else on the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we've been the first episode of the feeder series podcast. Goodbye.